welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's been just over a month uh, since we met in person uh, on 8th of November and we had the whole panel discussion on Plaksha campus. As a follow up, uh, we wanted to check on where we are and how can we uh, plan our next steps. On today's call, um, just to introduce and make sure everybody's um, on the same page, we have our GCSP team, Professor Rucha and myself. There's going to be uh, a lot of members of the academic team at Plaksha joining us in. The Associate Dean, Professor Shrikant, uh, Dean Vishal, uh, Professor Vishal, and the centers, uh, the four research centers that we are in the process of uh, launching and introducing to everybody. Uh, there's uh, center heads from all these four joining us on this call. Um, then there's Professor Bill Oaks, who all, most of you had met last month. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Kanta Reddy is joining us on uh, this call today, uh, but maybe we wait a few seconds for that. Um, apart from that, we have our four community partners, Sanji Sikhya, Read India, Institute for the Blind, and uh, Pechan Iksapar. Um, we did introduce uh, all four of them last month, so maybe uh, to brush up when we go, when the community partners present uh, their slides, maybe you can also give a one or two line description of uh, what the organization stands for. Uh, moving ahead, our agenda today is to bring together the research centers at Plaksha and our identified community partners and chart out a plan ahead with our Grand Challenge Scholars program on how can we carve out specific student projects which can uh, both provide manpower for the research center as well as uh, ex uh, have this vertical of social immersion through our partnerships. And secondly, with the help of Professor Oaks, who has already done uh, a lot of work in this uh, in this sec in, in the segment of community engagements through his uh, through the program of Epics at Purdue, uh, we we really appreciate your guidance and suggestions on uh, how can we on if you think our uh, program can um, take some inputs from there. Um, as we see, the agenda will start off with a brief introduction of GCSP, and then each research center will present for about four to five minutes uh, on uh, what kind of partnerships can they uh, expect and uh, where can we uh, support through GCSP. And then we'll open up the forum for each community partner to speak about their ongoing projects, uh, POCs from their teams that we can uh, take the conversation ahead with. Uh, at the end, we'll have an open discussion. To, to discuss points further. Um, I'll now hand over to Professor Rucha to give a brief of GCSP. Yeah, and I think uh, as last time, uh, you probably heard us say this many times, uh, I'm just uh, taking a, a short brief uh, overview again of the program. Uh, at Plaksha, we are uh, uh, really delighted to be a part of this international framework of Grand Challenges Scholars program. Uh, that uh, is hoping to prepare the 21st century engineer with uh, the required competencies and mindsets for addressing the grand challenges um, uh, that we face in the world, right? So uh, they are in the buckets of energy, security, uh, health, uh, joy of living, uh, and, and they can be contextualized to our um, local and uh, community day-to-day uh, -day problems that we see around us. So uh, the five competency framework that uh, the GCSP program at Laksha is taking is uh, that the, every student to be a Grand Challenge Scholar um, needs to exhibit a cutting edge a research competency, uh, a project that gives them an experience to address the Grand Challenge through technical rigorous um, training um, on the chosen uh, grand challenge. The second competency deals with having the students the social consciousness or uh, having them create solutions that is a identifying the need uh, for that addressing that grand challenge they have chosen and serving the society um, for that same identified need through their solution. Uh, 
the third, uh, which is also the USP of Plaksha, is the multicultural um, experience along with the social consciousness, is um, having students the competency to uh, share how their solution will work out in another cultural setting, uh, both within and outside India. Uh, so they could see that in a in a different state setting, let's say for if they're taking a water research project, um, water scarcity is a grand challenge. Uh, what works in maybe Punjab, does that work in Maharashtra or Goa? Uh, maybe the cultural setting requires the solution to be uh, further iterated upon. So that is the multicultural competency need and multidisciplinary is having the students do a full interdiscipl interdisciplinary uh, fusion of um, both the academic majors that we have at Plaksha as well as look at the social sciences, the law, the policy, regulations um, around solving that grand challenge. So not just look at it technically, but also through implementation execution side of it. And the last competency there is entrepreneurship, uh, having students develop viable business models. Uh, and it's not just limited at raising a venture, but also um, embracing that entrepreneurial mindset or entrepreneurial minded learning as they are working to solve that one chosen grand challenge. So that is in nutshell the essence of the grand challenge what a grand challenge scholar would have under their belt and to enable that um, if we can just go one slide next please um, at plexia we are uh, saying the students could choose any of these um, sustainable development goals or the na's uh, grand challenge framework uh, that they relate with most closely and justify why they want to solve that uh, before they enter that program. And if we go one slide next, please. Um, to enable this to happen, uh, we, we have devised this program to have them spend on each competency certain required hours. And these are uh, the hours that they have to show an evidence of through logged um, a project report uh, to their portfolio, um, to symposiums and their dissemination to the fellow uh, student community at Plaksha as well as outside Plaksha. So the hours that are here are not meant to be just defining uh, that those are, those are just a requirement for uh, the, the competency, but they are the bare minimum to show them evidence of uh, what they're working on. Uh, and we're hoping that that in, uh, further um, encourages them to uh, have much more depth into the uh, competencies and the hours there can be in increased and showed in their uh, portfolio. Um, if we go on the next slide, please, over to uh, Srishti. Uh, and just wanting to end on one note there, as we are carving out this program. One uh, facilitation that we want to do is that um, through the grand challenge centers that Plaksha since uh, the whole focus for our um, research centers as well as our curriculum is grand challenges. How can we leverage uh, those visions, uh, those um, efforts um, and align them with uh, our Grand Challenge Scholars program to serve each other better. That's what we are trying to look out here. Um, this uh, the, the research centers here uh, that we are showing on this slide are uh, predominantly in the areas of Center for Clean Energy and Climate uh, that Professor Vishal is heading. Um, Center for Digital Agriculture uh, now being represented by Professor Srikant and the Professor Shashank who is in the meeting. Um, Center for Water Security being led by Professor Prashant uh, and Center for Digital Health that is being led by Professor Sunita Chauhan also in the meeting. Um, so we would actually love to take this opportunity to have the center heads um, uh, discuss or uh, talk a little bit about what is the central um, uh, central theme of importance to each of these research centers and how could um, students be engaged um, in those grand challenge areas and how could we leverage the community partnership? What kind of field immersion, 
Uh, would you like, would you need to make these research centers more impactful for society? Um, and any specifics uh, of the center's plans of, or any ideas there for ongoing projects and opportunities for students and community partner engagements? Um, so I'll just um, give up 30 more seconds. I said that all very fast, but uh, happy to uh, elaborate any of that further or else um, uh, giving 30 seconds for all uh, center heads to uh, read this slide and then we'll go one by one into uh, each center heads um, elaboration of the grand challenge. Yeah. Seems like Shashank is ready to go first. Sure. Uh, so uh, Srikant and I are uh, leading the Center for Digital Health, uh, Digital Agriculture. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, our core mission is to actually uh, work on agriculture technologies with the ultimate aim of uh, doubling the yield of uh, the farm output in India but do it sustain in a sustainable fashion. Um, and that's our core mission, uh, vision statement and a grand challenge uh, that we want to pursue. So we are pursuing it with through uh, two uh, focus. Uh, one is focus on developing uh, new plant breeds and uh, uh, plant varieties which can uh, work with, uh, which can have high yield under different types of conditions uh, like high salinity, which is one of the big problems in the states of in state of Punjab. Uh, the other focus is more the technology focus where we want to uh, work on precision agriculture technologies like drones, IoT sensors, um, and deploy them to to help uh, guide decision making um, and and intervention abilities for the farmers. So an example of that that uh, could be that a drone could be used to identify where there are issues uh, with the plant health or where there are diseases uh, in which parts of the farm and then so that the farmer could uh, predict how much uh, fertilizers and where he needs to put put that in. Uh, so those are all different kinds of activities that we want to lead and uh, I think uh, we are looking for community partners. Uh, I think uh, Precision agriculture is one piece of it, but actually having it adopted by the farmers is that's where we require the community partnership. Uh, we require we are looking for help from um, from the farmer communities and um, organizations so that we can identify what kind of needs there are, right? Uh, uh, because just developing a fanciful technology is not enough. Ultimately, what we want is for the farmers to actually adopt them. Um, and that's, I think, one of the key things that we are looking for. Um, there are many ongoing projects and opportunities uh, that uh, that we already have actively uh, in the center. There are a couple of student projects. Uh, there are projects that our students have already take, undertaken through the ILGC program, and there are more research opportunities for the students as well. So happy to um, engage with the students and the rest of the GCSP community on that. So that's a little brief bit about my center. I'll uh, let others talk about their work as well. Thank you. Thank you, Shashank. Um, and I think, uh, you know, just uh, having that uh, uh, specifics of those uh, problem statements you shared, I really appreciated that. Uh, also, keeping in mind that uh, this could be a great opportunity for us to also uh, pitch in to the, for the CSRs. Um, uh, donors, um, this their funding raise fundraising opportunities for uh, both our community partners and us as to, uh, you know, if we do it through the student help. So, uh, inviting also the other center heads on uh, their thoughts for their research centers. Do we have Prashant here? Uh, yeah. Do you, yeah. Us. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rucha. Uh, so Prashant here and a very warm welcome from my side as well to all the partners. I did uh, get a chance to briefly interact with Will last month. Uh, hi, Will. And uh, I'm always a little bit confused. Is it Will or Bill? Because the name starts with a William, but then the short form is, is a Bill. So, uh, you know, sometimes I have that confusion, but I guess either works. Uh, either fine. Yeah. 
Fantastic. So I'm heading the initiative for uh, the Center for Water Security at Plaksha. And uh, we have identified three verticals in this. So the big vision, of course, as you would know, a simple way to explain water security is that it's in a simple sense, the opposite of water scarcity and water scarcity is a big issue uh, all over the world, but more so in India. And so we want to secure the water sources for all the domestic, commercial and environmental activities we want to do. Uh, that's the grand vision. And we, you know, split it in three verticals. One of them is uh, related to agriculture because um, for most of the agricultural activities, groundwater is predominantly being used and the groundwater table is getting depleted at an alarming rate. So one vertical focuses on groundwater and uh, looking at activities to replenish the groundwater. The second one is about uh, municipal wastewater, so that's sewage, and that's more on the circular economy uh, in uh, sewage. So how can we recycle and reuse uh, several resources from sewage, so not just the water, but also nutrients, uh, fertilizers, energy. So uh, what are the things we can recover from STPs? So that's, uh, and you know, reuse the water. So that's that's another vertical. And then the third vertical is regarding industry. So if you look at these, the, these three verticals uh, represent the three areas where water is mostly consumed. So domestic, agriculture and industries. Uh, in industries, we have an issue. Uh, we The government has enforced something called a zero liquid discharge. That means not even a single drop of water should be, you know, discharged from the industries. So how do we enable the industries to, you know, uh, implement this in an energy efficient way? So that's that's a vertical we are looking at. Uh, so that's sort of the areas uh, we are looking at to start with uh, for our center. In terms of the community uh, partnership, you know, uh, I think, Bill, I told you last time I've been in touch with my uh, colleagues from the Netherlands, and they are all pretty keen to work with, you know, uh, communities uh, in India, you know, uh, so the, you know, uh, either the rural communities or also, you know, any sort of um, economically less privileged communities where you have uh, issues with basic uh, water supply and hygiene. So we are looking to partner with, um, you know, uh, someone uh, who can provide us with these problem statements. We have been in touch with industries as well for those, uh, you know, problem statements. But we are looking to, you know, uh, maybe touch base, uh, touch base with NGOs and, you know, try to um, get to work together with uh, with these people. So not build for them, but build with them. So that's something my Dutch colleagues are also pretty uh, interested in. In terms of ongoing projects, uh, we do have, uh, like Shashank said, we do have a certain project that the students are doing uh, at uh, ILGC, so the Innovation Lab and Grand Challenge Studio that Rucha is running with the team. So they are working on, you know, ways to, uh, you know, improve the uh, water treatment, you know, maybe disregard the reverse osmosis that re uh, rejects a lot of uh, water. Uh, they have been working at more fanciful stuff like pipe inspection robots. So we do have a pretty strong robotics, um, you know, a faculty a group with us. So they're looking at uh, from the fancy side as well. We have a lot of non-revenue uh, water loss, you know, water loss that is happening even before it reaches the uh, users. So that's, these are some projects they are working, working on, but for the GCSP, I'm looking on projects where, you know, the students can actually step out with the communities and build with them. So these are, this could be basic water supply and sanitation projects. So these are some of the ideas I'm thinking about. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any uh, ongoing uh, opportunities other than ILGC that you have in mind for the center, like internships or? We we are working on uh, problem state statements, Rucha. So it's not ready, as in you know, it's it's not yet at a stage where the students can jump into it. But we are work, okay. certainly working on, like I said, uh, with my colleagues, we are trying to explore opportunities with NGOs here. You know, where uh, you know the students can get some tie-ups with the local communities. So if there is something that comes from uh, our partners here, we we would also be most uh, you know happy to discuss this with them. Thank you, Prashant. Yeah. Let me, yeah. Um, I think uh, Professor Sunita is also here. So, uh, if we can go to Center for Digital Health next, please. Um, can you hear us, Sunita? Uh, maybe we'll come back uh, to her. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Thanks. Yeah, but somehow the camera is not picking up. 
Yeah. Is it okay if I go ahead? Sure, please. Yeah. Yes. So uh, digital health, um, I would say, as you're saying, one of the biggest grand challenges, particularly to countries like India, what we are trying to envision at uh, Plaksha is to transform the future of healthcare, and not only for India, globally. And in that, we would like to make it more accessible, affordable, sustainable, and what we call these days as personalized or uh, customized healthcare through integrated digital uh, health infrastructure and innovative technologies. So we have also identified lots of verticals and horizontals, but prior to that, I would like to a little bit elaborate on what digital health, and though it is around for quite some time, but digital healthcare has evolved from the need for a more proactive and efficient healthcare delivery. And uh, it seeks to offer new types of prevention, uh, preventive healthcare as well, not only the uh, sick care or patient care, uh, but at a reduced cost uh, using methods that are only possible due to technology. For example, digital health technologies involve bioinformatics or medical analytics for uh, medical records, uh, so novel and emerging um, high impact biomedical health technologies uh, which can really transform the way healthcare service providers can deliver and uh, it's basically a cluster of new and emerging applications and technologies that exploit the digital part or mobile and cloud platforms for uh, treating and supporting the patients so the it's quite comprehensive or general a term in by nature, uh, but the innovation approach is being applied to very wide range of social problems, healthcare problems, uh, ranging from monitoring the patients in the intensive care or general wards or even PHCs uh, or, or based at home to help doctors make better and more accurate diagnostics, as well as um, uh, we have heard a lot about the under dosage or over dosage in the clinical environment. So making decisions or referral decisions for clinical uh, treatment, much more aware uh, decisions or informed decisions. So we have also identified here a large number of um, uh, uh, horizontals uh, based upon the skill sets that we have or uh, expanded skill sets, which we would like to have. So based on that, we would like to work on specific disease based, uh, particularly the top 10 prevalent diseases in India, or medical service, uh, uh, as well as automated uh, couriers, uh, which could be robotic couriers or any automated couriers, uh, rehabilitation, as well as um, assistive technologies, which may include uh, even tissue engineering, for instance, or robotics, medical robotics into it, or any intelligent systems which can help within the uh, medical infrastructure. So enhancing the medical infra infrastructure for more efficacious outputs. Um, we are also trying to see if uh, integrated interoperability between PHCs to secondary healthcare, tertiary healthcare. So EMR of medical records, as well as EHR, the health records, how uh, we can make them more portable from one setting, a hospital setting or a primary healthcare setting to another. And then integrated, uh, or you can say, uh, when we work across multiple cross-functional teams, then how we can make this integrated care, uh, smart, uh, of surgical tools in order to make the surgical processes more easy as well as more effective. So based upon all that, as I said, it's quite comprehensive by nature or generic also by nature because there are too many medical specialties and uh, if we are trying to support each one of them, that's how it elaborates. So the center, we are trying to have uh, academic partners, which could be research partners, uh, within India, outside India, for uh, with complementary expertise, uh, so that we develop together. Similarly, we could develop uh, more innovative solutions with the industry, uh, which could be, uh, you know, in market quite soon. 
and government partners in order to have this legislation um, or legal part of it, policy making part of it. So we are trying to see really from uh, multiple ends how we can approach this. Now, one example which I can give is, uh, for example, uh, the um, bank, uh, blood banks. So as we all know that despite many advances in medicine, there is no manufactured substitute of blood. So banked blood usually loses its ability to deliver oxygen to the tissues almost immediately after it is donated. So there is a possibility of, for example, this uh, online blood bank management system using digital tools or a central repository containing various blood deposits, uh, having a better vigilance, for example. I can give another example maybe from the pollution point of view. So as we know that the environmental pollution, uh, uh, I'm going a little bit beyond the hospitals and all that to give that how wide it could be. So we know that environmental pollutants can cause health problems, uh, respiratory problems, heart diseases, even some type of cam cancers as well, particularly lung cancer. So it becomes more critical in many populous uh, you know, cities, metro cities like Delhi, Calcutta, so on within India, as well as elsewhere. So giving us all sorts of pollution, chemical pollution, toxic, heavy material, so on. Uh, so how this, uh, again, poor waste management contributes to climate change and then affecting the uh, you know, greenhouse gases and human health. So we are trying to really approach this from a very comprehensive way, uh, not only hospital based or you know, primary healthcare based, but uh, from every point of view possible. So as I said, in terms of uh, the community involvement, uh, we could have a very other R&D as well as uh, you know, research centers, uh, which could be doing fundamental research rather than innovative as we are trying to engage uh, for co-development, uh, similarly with industries. But in terms of patient awareness, uh, how patient is ready to adopt the new technologies. So for that point of view, really uh, students or we can say volunteers, they can really help us in reaching out to the communities to help uh, patients with that kind of background knowledge, as well as we are developing or we would be developing, sorry, uh, mobile apps uh, to make patients aware. So that some patient uh, you know, advocacy in the community uh, could be developed. In that case, they are more aware, but they can also help making better decisions. Uh, uh, one of the cases, for example, in EMR, somebody has to put uh, their history, uh, medical history, and uh, patients, how aware they are, but what kind of things they are allergic to, or what is their blood group, even that kind of simple question in our villages and all. So we are trying to approach, as I said, in a very comprehensive way from every possible angle. And we would like to seek uh, help, as you said, from students, from other care groups, uh, particularly reaching out to the society. I hope I have covered all the points and if there are any targeted questions, I will be happy to. Thank you so much, Sunita. I think that was helpful and uh, myself also being associated with the Center for Digital Health, I uh, uh, fully am, uh, you know, the <laughs> proponent of also assistive technologies that Sunita mentioned. So uh, we are looking for help there, of course. Uh, I, I think uh, Professor Vishal is also on the call, so I would like to invite him uh, to share about the Center for Clean Energy, if he's here. Sure, thank Thanks, you. Uh, and I'm sorry I got a little late in joining. There was some uh, urgent call I had to attend to. So, uh, yeah, I'm working in the area of uh, clean energy and basically the overall uh, objectives of uh, this uh, center, the Clean Energy Research Center, are one to decarbonize the Indian energy sector. Uh, then the second is to bring in self-reliance so that our dependence on um, energy uh, from uh, foreign countries is uh, made zero and we generate all our energy requirements 
And the third thing is to make the whole infrastructure smart, uh, which includes the transmission, uh, storage, and use like homes, buildings, transportation, and all this. So, so, so these are uh, the three main aspects that we are working on. And this is a huge sector, uh, right from generation to transmission, distribution, storage, uh, energy efficiency. Energy efficiency can also be in building sector, transportation sector, industry. So it's a it's a huge spectrum of activities uh, that are involved here. So to begin with, uh, we have taken up two challenges. One is how to reduce urban heat island. And the second is how to go about uh, smart buildings. Now, the first one is on urban heat island. Uh, what we see now is that the cities are much warmer than the adjacent rural areas. And this is because of various reasons. One is uh, the human activities like, you know, transportation and electricity consumption and air conditioners, all this, they dump heat into the city. And the second is that city has very less uh, greenery and a lot of paved surfaces, and those are dark in color, like the roads and the roofs, and they absorb heat. So the cities can easily be four or five degrees centigrade warmer than the neighborhood. And when there is a heat wave, then it becomes very dangerous because the cities can achieve temperatures wherein the human survival can become a problem. And we keep hearing about people dying during heat waves. And this can become uh, worse with the heat island uh, becoming uh, worse. The cities are getting hotter. So, so you might be thinking, what is the relationship between this and the energy? So basically, with the increase in the city's temperature, there is increase in the city's energy consumption, obviously, because the air conditioning consumption goes up. And uh, it's kind of a linear relationship. And uh, with every one degree centigrade in the city temperature, about two to three percent increase of the whole city energy consumption can be observed. So how do we reduce the city temperature? Uh, we'll be working on the modeling uh, of districts. Districts here means, you know, big chunks of cities and see uh, how they work, uh, what different interventions, what is their impact on reduction of city temperatures. Here, for example, trees, white pavements, uh, less glass, uh, reflective roofs and reflective walls and all these measures. So here, uh, the interesting thing is that the Intervention has to be done at the community level, right? I have to do at my home. People can do at their building. Intervention is at a community level, but the impact, it, it can be felt at a city level. And especially the impact for the urban poor is something which is very important. So uh, how do we operationalize this is critical. How do we bring awareness to people that they should go for cool surfaces? how we can uh, bring uh, uh, low cost materials for urban poor because they don't have access to electricity, they don't have access to air conditioning, how can we do that? So a lot of these things can be done at the community level and awareness can be brought in. And also at the policy level, if government can mandate such things on commercial properties, say for example. So that is one area. And the second area is on energy efficiency through smart buildings. Uh, in which I will classify the buildings into two categories, smart homes and commercial buildings. So in, in, in homes, we can uh, shift some of the loads, like we can shift uh, water pumping, we can shift uh, uh, washing machine, uh, even the geyser we use in the winters, it can be shifted because they are storage type of geysers and we can heat the water and keep it whenever we need that. So, so we have to understand what are the incentives through which we can make people shift their behavior and go for shifting of the loads and how do we bring in energy efficiency 
because the cost of electricity is not that high. It doesn't hurt that much. If I if my bill is five thousand rupees and if I save ten percent, that's five hundred rupees, right? So it doesn't excite me to do all these things. So so the interesting thing about these research areas is that it is not just the technology. We are working at the interface of uh, human behavior, uh, on business models, on technology, on policy, on implementation. For any of these things to work, they need a lot, uh, huge awareness uh, work and huge deployment activities. So it's really involvement of everybody, all the stakeholders, which will make it successful. So, so these are the two areas we are working on and overall the challenge on the uh, clean energy. So have I covered uh, what you were expecting or? Yeah, yeah. thanks Vishal. Here? Yeah, only okay. the if, if there is any on the third bullet, uh, do you envision any uh, opportunities for yeah. students and community partner engagements? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these two uh, projects are on smart home and uh, uh, UHI mitigation. So if there's somebody who wants to help us in doing some surveys, so we are trying to understand what are the current practices in homes, what are the current devices in homes, so some kind of survey we want to do. And then also if somebody interested in developing these technologies, uh, uh, we, are, we are looking for people in these areas. Thank you so much. Yeah, and um, I think that was Really helpful. Um, I know we we are going to the community partners also next, but just real quick, but Amrita is also here, Professor Amrita. If uh, as a part of leading the IoT and Sensor Lab, uh, did you want to pitch in any thoughts also, Amrita? Uh, no, no, I, I don't have anything. Uh, no, sure, no worries. Yeah. Uh, Professor Bill, uh, are we OK if we hear from the community partners or did you have any uh, advice, any thoughts here before we go forward? No, we can go to the partners. It'd be great. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, OK, so uh, OK, I think Vijay is here, so inviting him first from Pehchan Ek Safar. Uh, he has already compiled together thoughts, but I hand it over to him for elaboration. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, uh, uh, along with me, Katyani is also representing a Pehchan Exapar. She is a president of Pehchan. And currently, we are working on a, a few outreach activities. And one of the our ongoing project is a lab on will, a mobile laboratory. So we are creating <coughs> a mobile laboratory. Uh, for the remote locations where the lab facilities or the basic science, scientific instrumentations are not available. So we wanted to take science to their home or uh, in the remote locations. So we are uh, in the process to develop few uh, a frugal type of experiments. Uh, like um, you can take an example of a microfluidic devices or a paper based sensors uh, to implement all these things in this lab on wheels. And uh, like we can implement uh, uh, and few examples or a few experiments, uh, maybe from the physics, chemistry or biology, we can uh, plan for uh, uh, some activities like uh, if we take some lenses and uh, some mirrors, then we can uh, we can teach the optics and the lighting phenomena uh, by using this uh, by using these instruments. So uh, we are planning to uh, uh, develop these kind of uh, projects uh, for our mobile laboratory, and like we uh, we will be happy to engage with the students from uh, Plaksha, like uh, if they want to contribute uh, in this mobile laboratory, then we will be happy to uh, collaborate with the uh, Plaksha, and like uh, these are the two point of contact from our side. And these are the few uh, social media platforms like uh, we are active. Excellent. Yeah, uh, I remember also. I think uh, there were some nice little uh, pictures also in your pamphlet, so that was very effective. Yeah, yeah. How many people you have touched upon? Yeah, so far. Uh, uh, Katyani is also here, so I also want to invite her if she wants to add to that. Uh, hi, Richa, and uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, It was a really nice interaction uh, and interacting again for the second time. 
so as uh, vijay uh, discussed about what were we are doing or planning to do uh, in pathonics of her uh, is a mobile laboratory where we again want to uh, inculcate the scientific temperament among uh, all the students who are not uh, who have don't uh, reach of uh, all these uh, experimental lab they are in uh, government schools or not going to school in any case uh, they have they can have some uh, kind of uh, scientific understanding so uh, we are basically uh, trying to do that uh, in our project which is a vija leading uh, our autry's project so uh, it is uh, i think uh, we can do uh, a lot more with uh, your volunteers uh, with our students uh, btech masters or phds so i think we can do uh, many good things uh, with uh, with available sources uh, an experiment we can design uh, by our own so i think uh, that's it from my side uh, quick a quick follow up question uh, how, how many uh, people and who are like what is their stakeholder profile kind of that can you elaborate on that you're serving currently yeah so like uh, if we talk about our part sala component so we have 75 kids uh, to whom we are teaching on day to day basis like we are tutoring them on science uh, in science engineering like you can say a stem education basically also we are uh, engaging them in the co curricular and extra curricular activities like cultural activities and maybe a art and craft all these things but apart from that uh, if we talk about the outreach activities so like we have a uh, 40 plus schools uh, currently engaged with uh, with the pehchan and we are uh, like on a weekly basis we are organizing uh, outreach sessions in one on that and uh, those all sessions uh, are on the different different topics like we are uh, taking some technological concepts and we are explaining science behind it we are also, we are also demonstrating a few scientific concepts to understand those technologies in a better and practical way just by taking some daily life examples thanks that's helpful yeah. thanks so much thanks okay okay uh, so we have uh, and okay next uh, uh, sanji sikhia abhiyan uh, if uh sunil is here i think he is in the meeting yeah so i uh invite sunil to take us into their efforts are you able to hear us sunil uh we can't hear you you're on mute in case you're trying to talk all right what if we come back uh, to sanjay yeah. we can go to read india uh hi shrishti and rucha thank you uh, thank you for giving us this this opportunity so uh, basically uh, we have all uh, all over india different centers around 55 centers and one of the nearest center to plaksha university is located at gajju khera uh, so with this purpose we have uh, shared few points on which uh, the students or from uh, plaksha university can work upon and the ideas are like if they can provide innovative ideas related to stem and that can be added in our proposals and which will definitely help the communities around uh, reach centers uh, and more interventions related to it skills could be introduced for the beneficiaries this could help them to be economically and financially more stable and apart from that it would be great if we can have continuous motivating and mentoring sessions which can be organized frequently for the beneficiaries it can be organized uh, virtually it can be organized virtually and uh, we have the nearest center if uh, student would like love to visit the platform is open for them i have provided the social media account for facebook for the read india page and this is the linkedin where they can actually tag in
So I think there's a question. Or okay, that's just a hands up. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Pooja. Uh, and oh, and Gaju Khera is the uh, closest and um, a field. Yes. Uh, yes. That you have. Yes. Also, we have with us Gaurav on the call. Uh, he has just joined Read India. So uh, Gaurav uh, uh, is basically situated at that place only, uh, like in Punjab itself. So uh, he would be there for the further coordination uh, along with me in Punjab itself because he stays there. So uh, for the all clarity on any of the part, he would be there along with me. Sure, yeah, thank you. I also just uh, I mean, a quick follow up as the women empowerment uh, area. I think last time we discussed it a lot and yes. uh, right. So right. our, uh, for example, your third bullet like motivation and mentoring sessions. Uh, these are also relating to the, the women empowerment field, right? Y yes. Yes, it could be for the youth as well. Right. OK, just just making sure. Yeah, thank you. OK, so I think Sunil uh, just uh, probably try to join in back. So are you able to. Uh, speak now or hear us? Sunil. Yeah. You hear me, Rucha? Yes, I can hear you now. Thanks. Your your connection is I think a little breaking up, Sunil. I guess. Um, is it better right now? A little bit. Uh, I think you're still breaking up, unfortunately. Uh, I think though, I think you have shared the uh, uh, the point of contacts here, and I know uh, pretty soon, actually, tomorrow itself, right? You have the presentations at Plaksha on your various projects, right? Oh, it's today itself. Yeah, yeah, they are on campus in the other building. Oh, awesome. OK, so uh, perhaps if there is any uh, specific uh, problem statements based on your uh, up to date uh, presentations that you just made today, maybe, you know, we'd be re really happy to float that also to students as well as our um, grand challenge centers. Um, so I think Richard, two just points I mentioned on the slide as well, which sort of align with our uh, center for water. If you see local communities facing severe problems of contaminated groundwater and consistent depletion and uh, huge uh, are huge link to farming practices with digital solutions. So maybe there could be, I mean, whenever your network's better, we can get on another call to elaborate on those. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If any details, if you could send us that, that'd be fabulous. And uh, if you're on campus, we, we can obviously catch up today. Thanks. Yeah. OK. Uh, we don't have volunteers from Institute for the Blind joining us today. They couldn't make it uh, with this time slot, but they've sent us a few problem statements that they are actively working on. Uh, one is the machinery, the instruments used by students to take notes, make a lot of noise. So a lot of students in the class can't really focus or uh, study at the same time with, with so much of noise levels was one problem statement. The other is uh, a project that our students from Plaksha are also actively working on, I think through the ILGC course uh, on how 
visually impaired students are mostly sort of forced to move into the arts field because there's not enough um, assistive technology uh, uh, to help them understand science concepts better. And three is, is the lack of equipment. Maybe we can take this ahead and uh, see what kind of projects can be framed for GCSP students. Sure. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, Professor Bala, who uh, is also a distinguished professor at Plaksha now, has had a last 10 years experience working in the field. He has also phrased um, some problem statements around conveying the concepts of uh, light, um, especially principles of reflection and refraction to uh, visually impaired students. Um, and uh, the other partner we had just an, uh, an update, uh, Aditya Bhatnagar. Um, uh, he was also interested in uh, uh, creating a program or um, uh, some sort of module to train the visually impaired um, students to be, um, you know, building um, competent, uh, you know, medical assistive technologies or helping out in medical field as well as in the uh, robotics and programming field. So that was an interest from another partner as an update. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, OK, so this one actually we have a question for uh, a bill specifically now that we have heard from all centers and we are also trying to carve out our um, uh, the ILGC is, of course, the mandatory program and, um, you know, having heard from the all grant challenge interests as well as the community partners, of course, there's certain um, competencies in mindsets like the social consciousness. Uh, some of it is thinking about scaling up, uh, feasibility, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, just a couple questions uh, to you, Bill. One is uh, where in the uh, curriculum side, uh, academic side, uh, how early should we bring in this, the service learning aspect, the Grand Challenge Scholars Program? Currently, it is situated at the uh, in the break of semester four and five, and then semester five and six. So it's coming in a little later stage. So how early and where would you ideally see it positioned? That was one. And uh, secondly, uh, based on all our uh, discussion so far, I think we uh, go back to that center slide, in fact, at the beginning. Um, how? What's your advice in how to best leverage uh, what we have here, the community partners and the Grand Challenge Centers to um, engage students uh, in the field work and uh, have a benefit for the stakeholders. Hi, Rucha, this is Srikant. Uh, sorry, I'm just interrupting before Bill responds. And sure, I'm here, please. I was here for the last some, you know, quite a bit of time. I'm, I'm here with uh, uh, Prashant and uh, Amrut. Awesome, OK, thanks Fine. for joining so go us. Ahead. I'm just letting you know I'm here. Yeah, no, please, if you have any thoughts also, uh, uh, please feel free to pitch in Srikant, yeah. No, perfect. Please go ahead. And if you need anything, ask me. I'll be here. Yeah, and uh, thankfully, Shrikant uh, is also leading our um, academic curriculum as an associate dean for undergrad studies, and we, sh Professor Vishal, is leading as a dean for academic studies. So, uh, it's a bonus for us that they're here. <laughs> yeah. I, <clears throat> so I, I maybe I was a little. Confused when you talked about the service learning. So the GCSP, one of the, I'm going to say limitations to one of the models is it's very student focused. It's kind of like you get a little experience here and here and here and here. And from a service learning and a engagement, it's more like this, the students go get an experience and then they're done. <clears throat> but if you th think about the, the kinds of partnerships I think that you're talking about is, is, is longer term. Um, 
there, there's some students may have an experience, but but there's 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 something that's longer and and can go deeper. So when you're talking about like the breaks, was it intended? That that confused me when you talked about right. like a, a semester um, break. Right. No, the breaks I meant was the summer break. Uh, so for the GCSP, we as we are carving it out. Uh, we didn't want to be uh, cramming it into the semester, adding on uh, to the students load. That's why we put it tentatively right now for, uh, for the summer as a summer course, basically for credit, academic credit. Uh, but that can go through iterations here. Um, it's not uh, for this first pilot that has been approved. Yeah. But what would your students be getting internships or? working in industry during that time? Um, so they, they're, they, they, they'll have an entire a semester seven or eight uh, dedicated to one of those internships. Um, so coming much later in the picture, uh, we are not encouraging to them to go as early as that semester uh, four end or semester five end uh, into. But Shrikan, Professor Shrikan could jump in here. Yeah. For thoughts. Uh, so I think uh, Rocha. Uh, so right now the uh, uh, semester, you know, the break period of three months is not a mandatory internship uh, offering. But you know, in case students choose to go, we are not stopping them from going, and we actually encourage them if they do find internships and during that time. So they are allowed to go. Uh, between semesters four and five, I think. Um, two and three. Mm, maybe between two and three, there's not, uh, you know, it's too soon for them to go on internships, but maybe. Um, between four and five is possible. It's possible that, you know, some of these, but again, you know. Again, the grand challenge scholars program is not open to everyone. So those who opt for the GCSP may potentially stay on campus. Uh, so that's something we would need to work out. And similarly, when we have the internship later on, which is a semester long internship, that's also not mandatory. So a student can choose to spend the entire time for a GCSP kind of activity as well. So it's open from both sides. Bill, uh, does that uh, help clarify or? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the is the re is the intent to get the students involved in research and then community engagement as separate things or are those integrated um so i think through each of the centers there is a provision to provide uh, educational uh, experience and a field immersion so it's not like they're both segregated we want it to be a part uh, if they want to be working on any of this center areas, any of uh, any way which are aligned with grand challenges, uh, they can take that up as their GCSP project. Right, and just to add to that, uh, so the we are definitely you know uh, trying to align the students with the goals of the research centers. And there may be some of those who just go up, you know, into deep tech or something that's not directly uh, related to the community or require a community outreach. And then there will be those who can also work on this. So if there is someone in the GCSP program, we'll position them such that it's a community related project. And there might be those who, you know, mm -hmm. who also uh, continue to work, but just on pure technological solutions. So, so one of the challenges, and in, in, in I appreciated um, the overview for the, the centers, that there's some of the centers, well, it, the definition of research is, is looking forward. 
in 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 future things. I, we also look at the results of the research. If we look at successful things that could be implemented or commercialized, if I look at some of the community issues, we're working with with populations that the current economy does not serve. <clears throat> so there are um, there may be related activities. You know, for for the research centers, it it it's finding. <clears throat> so if I if I look at the uh, climate issues with the 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 urban areas, and and I look at some of the buildings and and those things. If if you look for the poorer um, communities in the cities. They probably are not empowered to modify buildings. They, they're not going to have the resources to do that. Um, so if I look at that, the, the projects related to that might be adapting to the heat. Right. So so I've got the research that, that this is the thing that, that we can do longer term. Or or if I look at the, you know, the 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 digital agriculture and 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 that this is a mix it it's almost what could be done now for the farmers and understanding what some of the context is so for the students and and this is true for any of the engineers is i can go design a digital solution that involves my phone and 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 AI and, and and all these things, but do I start to have, do I have an understanding of what some of the smaller farmers, the underserved farmers, what their constraint really is? Um, what are some of the issues? And and <clears throat> is what are some of the projects or what are some of the things that could be done short term? that could provide a benefit over for the farmers, which in, in maybe I go to like the digital agriculture, there there are things that we can move digitally and, and add that could benefit all farmers, but it's very hard to design things for, for people that I, I don't understand. And so getting an engaged, with them on a project that that may not perfectly align with the research, but provides value and can provide information over in in to to that research. Um, what what I've seen in in in, in continuing on the, on the farmer um, I, I think thread. It is the students are, and, and we do that as engineers, overcomplicate and and um, add so much technology that now solutions are out of reach for for some of the the, the poor farmers in, in just understanding like like what are our current technology so so it's working at, at two different levels. Um I I also think, and, and this is just at, at a higher level going through it, is what is it that the students will do and how does Paksha partner with organizations in a longer term? So as students come in and out, how do we maintain a, a relationship? Because it it's it's easy to do a project if I go get some farmers and, and I get their time and we can develop something that makes us feel good. But then if those students leave and another another batch comes in and they start a project again, at some point we're taking advantage of the part the our 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 community. And and so I think if I think having these uh 
community experiences, something where the students come in and they come into a relationship. So the, th the things that we're starting, we've committed that we're going to have different batches come in, um, which, which may mean the student, right? The, the students get, don't get to totally pick and, and start a new project. But if I'm doing something with the farmers or I'm doing something in the urban areas to have uh, people adapt to the the heat, um, whatever those projects are, you've got a, a, a batch coming in that's going to be learning about the context and then advancing those solutions in some way and then handing those off to a next batch. And it would be great to get those batches talking to each other and, and to be able to, to hand things over. <clears throat> I think it's it's it 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 provides a nice connection to connect with the research centers. And then I think you have to think about what are the research activities that we connect with the students on, and what are the service things that they're doing? And they may be the same and they may be different. So I'm talking a long things, but not providing like concrete details. But 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 I think with each of these, you know, I can think if if you look at the centers as anchors to provide expertise, you're you're engaging with communities, and and you know, one of the things that I think of is when you look at the the innovations that we're heading there, who are going to be left behind? Who would we not touch? And and what could be done or extended to uh, to some of those people? Yeah, very uh, nicely put, Bill. Uh, thanks. I think uh, first of all, maybe some clarity on how we use research. So uh -huh. uh, you're right. Uh, so I think we've been loosely using the word. We have a component of translational research as well, where we want to do things immediately for societal benefit. And then there is the long term research. Mm -hmm. And you're right that there is a slight disconnect between the two. And it's, uh, you know, when we talk about having students aligned to these research centers, it's not the futuristic research. So some of that will happen. You know, that's where we'll have we'll have uh, PhD scholars and uh, some of those, uh, mm -hmm. you know, research engineers and uh, faculty driving the long term research. And then there will be offshoots of this, which we want to immediately translate into societal benefit, which is the translational research part. That's where we have the GCSP and you know students in mind, the uh, undergraduate level who can uh, take up these and you know talk to the uh, end users and probably are right. It's uh, the right sequence is first you talk to the end users figure out what exactly their needs are, and then within the research centers, figure out in what ways these... So the research centers will serve as the anchors, and within there, if the students can identify, uh, you know, what might be components that can directly go into solving societal problems, it's not necessarily anchored to the research centers. The research centers are just an easy avenue in terms of logistics, because they are funded, they have the intellectual power and guidance for the students. It's always possible students can do things outside these research centers as well. Um, well, and the, I think I I think you can do things related. I I mean, when I think about <clears throat> right, just your resources. It, it if I look at the community, right? There's some institutions that go, oh, let's look at societal issues. There are way too many than we can uh, we can address. And and I appreciate when you're talking about the 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 different research. <clears throat> I think it's different. So I use an example of our own institution that, that we were doing some things around food sovereignty with a indigenous community. And we had some industry advisors and they're talking about what's your price point 
And the answer to the price point was zero. You know, we're dealing with families that have no disposable income. <clears throat> You're like, well, there's really not a market there. I said, no, there's not a, you know, if I look at the farmers in a, I'll just go back to that because it's in the middle of my screen right now. Um, you know, the digital agriculture, there are things that we can do digitally to help agriculture in a large sense and all. The potential of the community projects is to say, okay, the bottom end of the e socioeconomic and can we learn more about that group so that translational research can have a larger impact? It it I, we tend to get pulled right if we're honest in the engineering field, globally, especially in the United States. But with here's the market, here's kind of the mean, or even you know the 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 people with more money here here's things from from a from a market standpoint. In these these projects, have the opportunity to just bring in a different perspective of. How will this translational research impact, you know, even even smaller, um, uh, lower income or, or other people? Um, if you think about just education for all of our engineers, we've done too many times we've done innovations without thinking of all people. And there's some people, that, right, that have been disadvantaged. But those projects may not involve the the really high tech aspects of the research center. They and, but they could be used to inform. So I love the idea about. <clears throat> I I I mean you've got when when you look at your research centers, you have one dealing with with agriculture and uh, food, water health, um, climate and energy, those, there's plenty to do there. And and then you, you use those themes to, to sort out projects because their students will, will identify needs to say, oh, here's a need that we want to look at. <clears throat> and if it doesn't fit in one of those centers, it, it's okay to say no. But, but I think with the, those centers and the activities that you've got can not only inform the, the students that are doing, but, you know, even the faculty and the other researchers is just thinking about, um, you know, d different stakeholders. But these projects, when I think of the projects, they're really about establishing relationships with different stakeholders that we might not normally be interacting with and learning about them. <clears throat> and our students, I think, believe that I can go out and ask somebody what they need and they're given a project description that's complete. But working over time with somebody to understand how they're living um, and, and, you know, how they may be impacted when I go back to the urban areas, it, it's some of the the people who really have no have no power to impact these changes, but are living right, live with the results of these things. What what do these things uh, look like? Yeah, and I just wanted to add to. Oh, uh, Bill, go ahead. You were. To say something, yeah. No, no, no. I, mean, I was. I think the point you raised, right? Like uh, having someone <clears throat> observe, live with them, and see, you know, what is the problem has a value to it. That I think that we could leverage in the center, uh, because maybe not just like like you know, just throwing out a survey as our students are also uh, realizing uh, may not bring out uh, the problem correctly. Uh, even though sometimes the user doesn't know what exactly they want, right? So observing that, uh, immersing in that field is, I believe, is an important aspect because there might be difference between what the user 
wants versus what they really need. Uh, and that's and it, it can be immersion, like I go live somewhere, but it could also be <clears throat> we're starting a project. You know, when I think of these projects, I think we think of each project is is going to be Nobel Prize worthy and a thing into itself. But some of these projects are ways that we can establish a relationship. So so when I think of especially some of the early projects, they may just be establishing connections in relationships that to get to know the people too. Be, be, because that that's one of the constraints that you've got. If if I'm taking this as a course, I've got limited time. And and so the students and we get to know the partners a little bit, and then we start, you know, moving forward. <clears throat> I, here's a question: because one of your partners, you know, on here, or we've talked about education. Um, but there's really not a research center that connects directly for education, or this just may be something as a is a theme that the you know if I think about an education related engagement or or something with with schools, it is how you're taking. How you're taking the 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 knowledge or or the issues related to the center, and translate those down and in, into schools like hands-on activities and uh, and things like that can be another way to connect with the centers. It, it is creating modules that could go out to schools. One thing I I'd like to add there, Will, is that you know uh, when. I forgot the names, uh, but they were talking about this mobile lab idea, taking out the projects to the communities uh -huh. and villages. Uh, I'm thinking it could be a wonderful opportunity, even if you don't see it from a research perspective, it can be an outreach or an awareness com component for the center itself, right? Which is also pretty important uh, that people are aware what are the problems and what type of solutions can we provide. So in that perspective, th those sort of projects could be connected with the research centers is what I think. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. I think uh, definitely Prashant uh, and also uh, I, I think and to add to uh, the question you asked Bill about the center uh, for is there anything on education? We do have a center for innovation in education. Uh, it's not uh, put it on, on that slide to uh, show that these are the grand challenge research areas that are uh, mm -hmm being focused on, but basically the education being an integral part of these centers um, and similarly for Center for Education, you know, disseminating, uh, like you said, you know, through teaching modules and training and professional development of even the surrounding college teachers, um, that's uh, an upcoming area we are developing. Uh, indeed, yeah, yeah. So for the oh, go ahead, Srishti, yeah. For the other question, I think I I, I understood uh, your take on you know how the research centers activities could be related, um, could mm -hmm. leverage each other's, uh, you know, especially in that widening the the translation. Well, and I think I I think it becomes a nice way to connect students with the research centers. And it provides the research centers with ways to reach out. You know, I mean, there, there there's flow. It it's, and it doesn't have to be them. But if you can connect with things that you're already doing, existing structures, it may should make your life a little easier. Right. Definitely. I think I had one more question for you. As says uh, our community partners uh -huh. are also here. You know, how do you, uh, you mentioned uh, a little bit, you know, maybe some of these initial projects could be around establishing that connection. 
I'm also interested to know your take on how to sustain this relationship once there is a connection established. Um, um. <clears throat> I think you use the projects and things that you're doing. I, I, this is where I think if you've got students also that can connect and pass these projects on, that has a, a, a continuity of relationships. So when a project is identified and is successful, then you get the students working with the partner to say, okay, what's the next thing that we could do over here um, related to this? Often when we're doing one project, we identify another need. Or, you know, if I go back to like the mobile labs, there's probably a version 1.0 and then there's a another version 1. Point something or 2.0. Um, if I think of the you know, work over with the farmers. They're probably some simple projects, probably more mechanical based. And then you start to look at how you could add some more technologies or or what could that be? So I think it 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 it's as simple as with the partners, when you start working with them, you think of the the unit of engagement with them is the relationship, not the project. Projects fall out of that relationship. So if 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 they're interested in working longer term, as long as they're still interested with each cycle, and and it's it it's just it's letting them know that you're interested in working with them long term, and it's just asking, are you still interested in working with us moving forward? And can we identify another um, project? I, I, what what I've seen it is the students will get often they'll get to something that almost works, and so the next batch is coming in, and they're going to work on a project. So a, a set of projects can actually last through several batches, or or it it works okay, but it could be upgraded, and and here's some things to do, and and the next group can come through. And part of that with the continuity is the students don't get to do this big needs assessment and ask these people what they need. They're picking up an existing relationship, but but that's what they're going to do for the rest of their careers. I mean, that's what we do in industry it, is we, we hand things off. Very nice. Okay. It, uh, it, it it makes it easier if I have continuing partnerships because then you don't have to go find new ones. And it's going to add more value to the community. The, the other side on that is how we keep the partners is to make sure that they're receiving some type of value. Uh, Rucha, you had uh, one question earlier about the students doing some of these activities during the semester break or during the semester. So did that get answered and what was exactly the question uh, for that? It was, yeah, the question was how early uh, would you uh, ideally want to introduce these aspects in the <clears throat> curriculum? As okay. in, yeah, semester two, three, yeah. yeah. Then following up on that question, I think, you know, with what Bill talking about this, system of handing over uh, from team to team, maybe, you know, across the years. So does your program uh, have a requirement that everyone should be exposed to the same aspects of uh, GCSP? Because what might happen is the first few founding batches may do a lot of venturing into the you know society, talking to the end users. The people that come after that, if things are handed down, uh, may not get as much and you know, it's also not possible for every batch to go into society because people get fatigued after that. I've seen this happen before in some places where students go to the immediate you know, community and then batch after batch, they do it and then 
it yeah. uh, they don't go to any new place they go they, everyone goes to the same households and keeps pinging the same set of people so that's yeah. also something we would need to worry about My right question, and then the, yeah. right the household gets tired of answering the same question yeah exactly yeah yeah you hit the nail on my two questions exactly. Well, the next right, things. but okay. If I if I think about this, and when I think of these projects, if I'm developing something, I'm using a, a human centered approach. Awesome. Is I have to get to know the people, but I'm getting to know them as part of the relationship. So so I'll use an example. <clears throat> Friday, one of my teams works for the Indiana School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And our initial partnership, we did all these things and the, the students from the school came and visited and we did things to learn about them. What we hope is there's some of that knowledge that stays with the students that gets passed down, but each batch has to see the school but they're seeing the school as part of an update on the status of the projects they're working on. And they're learning about the school. So they don't go out to visit the household, as you said, knocking on the door to say, hi, we're here. Can you tell us, you know, you're not going to the farmer and go, okay, tell us about the farm. What you're doing is going with some knowledge but we're also trying to do things to um, <clears throat> we're, we're, the, the students have something that they're, they're carrying forward. And so they're interacting with the farmers at that point. Now the challenge is you have a new batch coming in that doesn't know. And what is it that they should do to learn about that context? Um, that becomes a great thing to involve the students. So some of our students sometimes will get um, will get involved to say, how do we orient the new batch? You know, maybe it's we're going to go into the community and we're going to do something that's just service for a day. We go for a Saturday and we do some cleaning up or we do some organizing. Um, perhaps the farmer has something, I don't know, we go out into the field on one of the days where they're cleaning a field or, or something and spend time with them. <clears throat> um, what you describe <clears throat> is when they go out to the village, you know, and they all knock on the same door. The students think it's like, oh, I'm going to ask you what you need and you're going to tell me. And they had this great experience. But if I go out and they see that we've provided value and now we're interacting around this device or the solution, you're going to get you're going to get different information. But 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 that's that's a continuous it, what you describe is a challenge that that you you face in industry all the time is if is I've got a new I've got new people come, you know, new hires coming in. How do we get them up to speed and then to understand the context? And and I think getting to students to think about how you orient that next, you know, the batch behind is a great learning experience for them because it's going to depend on each partner. We have a group that works with an NGO that does low income housing. And if if the students spend they they they're doing different projects but if they spend a day with a construction crew physically building they learn a lot more and they have a better relationship with the with the staff no all all great valid points i i think one of the i'm just thinking out loud quickly here about uh, the same experience of you know the same tension of how a new hire comes in uh, I'm looking at it from the community partner uh, mm -hmm. model. You know, how do the NGOs, uh, or let's say like Pechan Exapa, right, uh, in, in the mobile lab, as a new recruit comes, they have their orientation, right? So uh, perhaps there are merits to that model also that we could look, dig deeper mm -hmm. and 
merge into this. It, it, of it, it, it's probably a different orientation for the different projects and the different batches. Hmm. So it, it it's decentralized some, but I think with every one of them, that's a question to ask. It is how do we orient that next that Correct. next group? Hey, I think that could be in, indeed uh, a question for our next uh, uh, meeting, uh, right, Srishti? Uh, in fact, if we can have another uh, session planned out with exactly how do we orient, you know, even a brainstorming on that with each of our community partners. I would really appreciate uh, that to learn. And in the meantime, I want to keep working on um, this model. Uh, I'll perhaps Srishti and I will also forward you some uh, conceptual maps or uh -huh. mind maps. Uh, I would love to have your input uh, on further easing it. Are you going to cr um, the IUCE conference? Yes. In Mysore? Okay. Yes, both of us. All right, so we can spend some time there. Fabulous, we'll do that. You're, you're yep. there from 4th to 8th? Yep. All, yep. All days. Excellent, so uh, that is in favor of us. Thank you so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually for the next steps then, I I know we had <laughs> the time ended really quickly. <laughs> uh, I wish... Uh, Mm -hmm. <laughs> one and a half are gone soon, but uh, I think as in next steps, uh, what we I would uh, post to the community partners also is to further um, think of any uh, specific asks from our side, from from the students. Uh, what are the specific uh, uh, skill sets or competencies or mindsets, if any, that you need? Uh, them to be trained or to be field ready. Um, that is one question. And secondly, like I said, maybe how can we uh, orient them? How do you orient them currently in batches? And so is there anything there we can brainstorm on together to cover? Those are the two questions I have. Srishti or um, anyone else uh, wants to add to that, uh, please feel free. And likewise, if there are any questions for us, uh, please feel free to to let us know, yeah. So yeah, it's all good, yeah. We can, as a follow up, maybe we'll write to the community partners and have a separate meeting with them one on one or together for the next week. This was very, very but, helpful uh, for us to have all of us together. And this was, I think, the first meeting that shared both the, the, the Grand Challenge Centers uh, uh, heads uh, thoughts together with the community partners. So. Uh, I really, really appreciate time from all of the center heads as well as community partner leads and especially Professor Bill Oaks for <laughs> making it time for, for, from totally different time zone. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, I look forward to uh, meet you in Mysore and uh, have a further ready iterated version uh -huh. of this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. John. Have yeah. a good evening. Uh, I'm you have go a great start morning. my day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Well, bye. Thanks. Thanks, Pooja. Thank you so Thank much. You.